Hey everyone, welcome to our cardiac muscle dysfunction lecture. Uh, we just covered ischemic cardiovascular conditions. This is a related topic. Uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about conditions involving some type of myocardial dysfunction, some type of muscle dysfunction uh, that leads typically to some type of heart failure. Cardiac muscle dysfunction is sort of a broad term. It is typically what precedes and is the most common cause of congestive heart failure, which is really what we're going to be talking about this chapter. Uh, its causes can include any or all of the above, typically in combination, uh, that can do some sort of damage either quickly uh, or over time, leading to to an inability of the heart to uh, to meet the cardiac output demands that are placed on it. It just cannot eject enough blood out of the ventricles to meet the demands of the body. A lot of this is a part of aging. Uh, not that everyone who gets old is going to experience heart failure, but there's a lot of things that happen uh, that put you more at risk of getting heart failure as you age. One of those things is decreased elasticity of the blood vessels. So if you picture the blood vessels and you picture the big surge in systolic pressure and then the drop to diastolic and then the big surge, there's a lot of uh, variability in the forces that are placed upon your arteries. And if they don't have that elasticity, if they become more rigid, that leads to increased blood pressure. And if you guys remember, increased blood pressure or hypertension means there's more afterload. So your heart has to generate more contractile force in order to open the semilunar valve, either the aortic or the pulmonary semilunar valve. That leads to ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, also, as you age, you can have, I'm sorry, I just forgot to mention, increased vent ventricular hypertrophy leads to decreased ventricular compliance. So it doesn't fill as well. So now, yes, the heart is getting stronger to accommodate, but it isn't filling as easily, which means that's affecting preload, which is affecting cardiac output. Also, we have decreased responsiveness to the sympathetic nervous system, decreased adrenergic responsiveness, which leads to decreased heart rate. So we have decreased preload and decreased heart rate. If you guys remember from the very first week, those are the two variables that influence cardiac output, and they've both been decreased, so that's not good. Uh, we also have a decreased rate of sarcoplasmic reticulum pumping. Um, we haven't talked a lot about muscle contraction, but uh, calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and so in order for a muscle to relax, you need to pump all of the calcium out of the cytoplasm into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And if you can't do that as quickly, what that means is you have a prolonged time for cardiac relaxation, which means uh, it's, the heart won't fill as well. Also, as, as we age, there's a prolonged time to peak force production, which means a longer contraction time. So all these things are, are not good. They're associated with decreased heart rate and decreased filling. We have decreased twitch force decreased ATP hydrolysis, which slows down contraction, decreased ATPase activity, which also slows down contraction. We start to experience a diastolic dysfunction, meaning that the heart isn't able to relax as quickly or as completely for all the reasons above, which further impairs ventricular filling. And we start to lose body mass. We're not able to deliver glucose and oxygen as well as we should. So the body has to accommodate by decreasing muscle mass. Uh, that's the first thing that your body is willing to sacrifice. So that leads to a further decrease in muscle strength and VO2. It's tough getting old. So that whole long list that we just talked about here, this is really setting us up for heart failure. Heart failure is a type of uh, myocardial muscle dysfunction. And there are multiple different ways to categorize heart failure. One of the most common ways is right heart failure versus left heart failure. We'll talk about that. Uh, another type is called heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction or heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. So 
Let me draw something really quick. This is probably a mistake. <laughs> I apologize, but we'll give it a shot. Let's just draw, let's try to draw a heart here. It's going to be not the prettiest heart you've ever seen. I apologize. So we have our atria and our ventricles with our AV valves. And let's draw our myocardium. Okay, not the most accurate thing I've ever seen, but you get the idea. And unfortunately, what I'm really trying to show you is this valve right here. You know what, maybe we can use, let's use this because it's already drawn for us. Okay, so here's our left ventricle. Here's the aortic semilunar valve. If you imagine that your heart is able to generate, or your left ventricle is able to generate 100 millimeters of mercury in pressure. I, I guess I don't need to write that out for you guys, but that's no problem at all if your diastolic blood pressure is 80, right? Because you generate 100, that opens this one-way valve, and blood leaves the heart. Now, we can measure what percentage of this volume of blood are we able to force out per beat, and we can report that in percentage terms. That's called ejection fraction. But imagine if this went up to, you know, 90 or even 99, we're not going to be able to get that much blood out because we're only going to be able to, this is, remember, this is peak pressure. So this is at max contraction. Most of the time the ventricle is contracting, we're not going to be at that point. So there's only going to be a little moment where we can squeeze blood out of our left ventricle. That's going to lead to a reduced ejection fraction. Anyway, the point is when it comes to heart failure, you can have heart failure where ejection fraction does not decrease too significantly. That'd be the P, preserved. Or you can have situations where it's reduced dramatically. That'd be the R, uh, reduced ejection fraction. And then lastly, we have systolic versus diastolic dysfunction. And I believe that this will, this video will explain most or at least a few of these. So let's check it out. Heart failure occurs when the heart is unable to provide sufficient blood to meet the body's needs. Heart failure is not a disease on its own, but rather a consequence of other underlying conditions. The impairment of the heart function can be due to an inability to pump effectively during systole, called systolic heart failure, or inability to fill properly during diastole, called diastolic heart failure. Heart failure can be right-sided or left I just wanted to stop really quick. That's such a just a good way to illustrate it. So systolic heart failure, that's when you're unable to eject blood from the heart adequately versus diastolic where you're unable to fill the ventricles adequately. Both result in decreased cardiac output, decreased ability of the heart to get blood out of the ventricles into the pulmonary and systemic cir circuits. So uh, the end result is essentially the same, but you can see how they're two different processes. Left-sided, depending on the side that is affected. About two-thirds of all left-sided heart failures are caused by systolic dysfunction. In systolic heart failure, ventricular contraction is compromised. This may be caused by any condition that weakens the heart muscle or creates more difficulty for the ventricle to pump. The most common include coronary artery disease and its consequences. Plaque buildup narrows the coronary artery, reducing blood supply to the heart muscle. Complete blockage can cause heart attacks, which often leave behind non-functional scar tissue. Dilated cardiomyopathy. So you can see how this relates to our last chapter. A very common cause of heart failure is ischemic heart disease. This literally results in death of myocardium, portions of the myocardium. And if it's in the ventricle where that occurs, that's going to cause systolic dysfunction. Apathy. The ventricular wall is dilated, becomes thin and weak. Hypertension. Higher systemic pressure makes it harder for the ventricle to eject blood. This is because the pressure in the left ventricle must exceed the systemic pressure for the aortic valve to open. Valvular heart disease. 
Damage to the valves, such as stenosis, also makes it more difficult for the ventricle to pump. The effectiveness of ventricular contraction is measured by the ejection fraction. Typically, the left ventricle is filled with about 100 milliliters of blood, but only 60 milliliters is ejected during contraction. This corresponds to an ejection fraction of 60%. The normal range of the ejection fraction is between 50 and 70%. When ventricular contraction is impaired, the volume of ejected blood is reduced, and so is the value of the ejection fraction. In systolic heart failure, it drops below 40%. In diastolic heart failure, the ventricle is filled with less blood. This may be because it is smaller than usual, or it has lost the ability to relax. The ejection fraction may be normal, but the blood output is reduced. The ejection fraction is therefore commonly used to differentiate between systolic and diastolic dysfunction. Ex- so that's that's pretty interesting, and that, that this ties into this as well. Uh, with a reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction. That's sort of a similar way of describing systolic versus diastolic. So you may read any one of these in a chart uh, in a hospital or a skilled nursing facility. So I just kind of want you to understand what they mean. Um, and, and we'll also talk about right versus left. So I'm, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll just let this video play. Examples of conditions that can lead to diastolic heart failure include hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, The heart muscle grows thicker than usual, leaving less room for blood filling. Restrictive cardiomyopathy. The heart muscle becomes rigid, unable to stretch. Hypertension can also cause diastolic dysfunction indirectly via compensation mechanisms. As higher systemic pressures make it more difficult for the ventricle to pump, the heart compensates by growing thicker muscle to try harder. Larger muscle means reduced space for blood filling. Regardless of being systolic or diastolic in nature, left-sided heart failures share a common outcome, less blood pumped out from the heart. As a result, blood flows back to the lungs where it came from, causing congestion and increased pulmonary pressure. As this happens, fluid leaks from the blood vessels into the lung tissue, resulting in pulmonary edema, a hallmark of left-sided heart failure. Accumulation of fluid in the alveoli impedes the gas exchange process, resulting in respiratory symptoms such as shortness of breath, which worsens when lying down, and chest crackles. Right-sided heart failure is most commonly caused by left-sided heart failure. This is because the increased pulmonary pressure caused by left-sided heart failure makes it harder for the right ventricle to pump into the pulmonary artery. This results in systolic dysfunction. In compensation, the right ventricle grows thicker to pump harder, which reduces the space available for filling, eventually leading to diastolic dysfunction. Other common causes of right-sided heart failure include chronic lung diseases, which also raise pulmonary blood pressure. As the right ventricle pumps out less blood, the blood again backs up to where it came from, and in this case, the systemic circulation. This results in abnormal fluid accumulation in various organs, most notable in the feet when standing, sacral area when lying down, abdominal cavity, and liver. The fluid status can be assessed by examining the distension level of the jugular vein. Heart failure is usually managed by treating the underlying condition, together with a combination of drugs. ACE inhibitors and beta blockers are used to reduce blood pressure in patients with systolic dysfunction. Diuretics are used to reduce water retention. All right. I really like that video. That's a good, quick five minute description. So expect quiz questions on this, you know, differentiating between systolic and diastolic. Uh, right versus left is also a great. One, for quiz questions, we could ask a question about, you know, a patient has uh, respiratory symptoms such as, and we'll talk about these some more in a bit, but such as crackles and productive cough, um, you know, difficulty breathing, etc. Does that sound like right-sided or left-sided dysfunction? And you would say left because fluid is backing up in the lungs versus a right-sided dysfunction. You're more likely to have peripheral edema. Um, and uh, fluid retention in the abdomen and distension of the abdomen with venous distension, like jugular distension. So uh, those are all some possible quiz questions. 
Okay. And so let's get into this. We're going to talk about signs and symptoms. You've already just seen several, but this is uh, uh, some more here and, and we're going to go through them one at a time. So I'll just move on. So a very common one is difficulty breathing, uh, dyspnea, uh, orthopnea, which is difficulty breathing while laying down, or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. So uh, dyspnea, just generally speaking, is difficulty breathing uh, or breathlessness. And in the case of left-sided heart failure in particular, that's due to fluid in the alveoli. It makes gas exchange very ineffective and inefficient. PND or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, um, it's, a, it's like orthopnea, except that orthopnea, uh, which is difficulty breathing laying down, is immediate. As soon as you lay down, someone has difficulty breathing. With the paroxysmal, paroxysmal dyspnea, you go to bed generally okay, but then all of a sudden uh, you have shortness of breath at night. And likely what that is due to is a ventilation perfusion mismatch. If you remember from one of our lectures, we talked about how the dependent portion of the lungs is going to have a higher blood supply. And so lying flat, what tends to happen is that you have a lot of blood in the back of the lungs and a lot of hyperinflation in the front, and you become short of breath with over time. Uh, so, so two similar things. Again, orthopnea is like PND, except it's pretty much immediate. And so that's kind of a common way to describe left-sided left -sided heart failure in particular is uh, or at least a symptom of difficulty breathing, is whether or not they have two, three, or four pillow orthopnea, just meaning how many pillows do they need to put under their head in order to breathe efficiently. So we'll talk about some breathing patterns. Uh, one very common breathing pattern is just rapid, shallow breathing. Uh, also, another um, another thing common with heart failure is extreme difficulty breathing with the position change. Part of that is just due to blood pressure dropping. Uh, so you have a, a ventilation perfusion mismatch. That's orthostatic hypotension. Very common, huge issue in physical therapy. Somebody stands up, they black out, they fall, they hit their head. So that's a big thing that we have to be cautious of and train our patients to be prepared for. We can also measure that. We can measure their blood pressure in supine sitting and standing quickly, back to back to see how concerned we need to be about falls with transfers. And then also Shane Strokes, respiration, we'll, we'll talk about all of these right now, and you'll be able to listen to them. Welcome back. In this video, we'll hear the different breathing patterns that you'll see in the study of your step one exam. This includes Shane Stokes breathing pattern, Cosmos, and Biot's breathing patterns. First, we'll have to be familiar with the normal breathing pattern, eupnea, and this will be our baseline. And it goes something like this. Next, we have tachypnea, which is the rapid breathing, and we see this in many disorders such as pulmonary embolisms, MIs, panic disorders, and many others. And here is how it sounds like. Next, we have brachypnea, which is the low-frequency breathing pattern that we see in obesity and alcoholism. Next, we have Biot's breathing pattern, which is the result of brain insult. Think of strokes, encephalitis, or many others. It's described as a period of apnea, followed by rapid breathing, and followed by another period of apnea. And here's the pathophysiology behind it. We know that the brain normally controls the normal breathing pattern, but in case of brain injury, the breathing center will be inhibited and will only start functioning again in case of strong stimulus. In this case, the strong stimulus is increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the blood. And here is how it sounds like. <laughs> 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 
Next we have Sheen Stocks pattern, which is the result of cardiac damage. It's similar to Biot's breathing pattern because they're both preceded and followed by a period of apnea. However, Shane Stokes pattern is gradual increase followed by gradual decrease. And here's how it sounds like. And finally, we have Cosmol's breathing pattern, and we see it in acidotic states. It's similar to tachypnea, but it differs because it has long tidal waves. So it's max. All right, we'll leave it there. So I remember uh, learning about Shane, Stro St Shane Stokes. I'm sorry, I put an extra R in there. Uh, Shane Stokes respiration or waxing and waning respiration in PT school. And I, I mean, I'm sure I knew it at the time and took note of it. But now listening to that again, having worked in in the field, people with congestive heart failure do breathe like that. There's this like very unique and distinct breathing pattern that is Shane Stokes respiration. So also rapid shallow, shallow breathing is incredibly common and extreme dyspnea is incredibly common. So, so to, uh, I, I like how they pronounced it to kipnea. <laughs> I'm used to just tachypnea. Um, but, but that's very common rapid breathing, orthostatic hypotension, and uh, waxing and waning breathing patterns, very common with CHF. Now, when it comes to CHF, especially with left-sided heart failure, we're going to hear some interesting lung sounds. Uh, so, and typically when associated with CHF, they're going to occur during inspiration. And what you're hearing is fluid movement and opening of alveoli, alveoli that were closed by fluid. It almost makes like a, a popping noise, which kind of sounds like a crackle. Uh, or often called rails. So a description of all of these is present on page 98. Uh, but this is another great video. It's, I think this video is a little long, unfortunately, but it goes through all of the breathing patterns, which we'll be learning in lab. So I want to play them all, even though really for this chapter, we're most concerned with rails. Let's just go ahead and listen to it. Hi guys. Welcome again to Intellect Medigos, where learning is made easy. I'm Dr. Chirag Madan, working as an intensivist at Apollo Hospital, New Delhi. In this video, we are going to discuss about the auscultation part of the respiratory system. If you talk about the examination, the first thing is obviously the inspection. Second, palpation. Third, percussion. And then comes the auscultation. But this auscultation is very, very, very important. All because nowadays many cl clinicians they are uh, they, they are relying more on the investigation part getting the ABGs x-rays or HRCT but uh, what I uh, what I think is examination is much more important than the investigation obviously you need investigation to rule out to make a diagnosis but the first and foremost thing is so First and foremost, whenever we talk about the breath sounds, we categorize it into either normal breath sounds and abnormal or adventitious breath sound. In normal, there are three sounds. First, it is vesicular breath sounds. Second, bronchovesicular. And third is bronchial. Whereas, if you talk about the adventitious, there are crackles. Second, V's. Third, uh, ronchi, fourth, strider, and fifth, pleural rub. So these are the basic and the main uh, adventitious or the abnormal breath sounds. Now, first of all, you need to hear it, how it is heard, and then I'll describe the characteristics of each and every breath sound. So starting with the first one, that is a vesicular breath sound. This is how it is heard. Now, as you have all heard about the sound, the name says vesicular. Vesicles su suggest alveolar, but this is a misnomer or a misleading term. These breath sounds are not generated or initiated inside the alveolar, right? So, uh, and these are vesicular breath sounds are present majority of the lung fields. 
Now coming on to the characteristics of these, first and foremost is it is very soft. Second, it is low pitched as you have heard. Third, the inspiratory phase is much longer than the expiratory because expiratory is a passive process and the sounds which are produced are because of the turbulence. So that is the reason the expiratory phase is less if you talk about the vesicular breath sounds. And fourth is there is no gap between the inspiratory and the expiratory phase. So these are the four important characteristics of vesicular breath sounds. Now coming on to the next one that is bronchial breath sound. This is how it is heard. These bronchial breath sounds are first of all as you have heard are loud, second high pitch and the expiratory phase is longer than the inspiratory and the fourth is there is a gap between the inspiratory and the expiratory phase and that is the difference between these two the vesicular and the bronchial. Coming on to the third one. The third is bronchovesicular which is heard mainly at the manibram, right? And this is how it is heard first of all. Now this breath sound bronchovesicular is intermediate to bronchial and vesicular. So the pitch and the duration is intermediate and the inspiratory and expiratory are of equal intensity and equal duration, right? But if the bronchial or bronchiovesicular is heard over the other regions of the lung, right? Or the other lung fields, then there is a pathology. These pathology, you can remember with the 4C. First of all, there could be collapse. Second, there could be consolidation, that means pneumonia. Third, there could be cancer or carcinoma, bronchogenic carcinoma. And fourth, there could be a cavity. So these are the four pathology where if you auscultate and if you are uh, hearing a bronchial sounds or bronchiovesicular, then this suggests there is one of these pathologies. Now, coming on to the other, that is the adventitious or abnormal breath sounds. The first is crackles. This is how it is heard. Now, as you have heard the crackles, this is like... So, just a reminder, sorry about that. Just a reminder, this is the one we're most often going to experience with, with uh, congestive heart failure. Uh, a cellophane paper being crumpled or a tissue paper or a paper, just a paper being crumpled. So this is like a bubbling sound, right? Now the, this is a non-musical and a non-continuous sound and it is mainly categorized as fine crackles or a coarse crackle based on the intensity, the pitch, the duration and depending on the whether the there is a positional change or not, whether it is settled by the coughing or not. So it is categorized in these two, fine or a coarse crackle. So let's hear the fine and the course differently. Now this crackling sound is because of the secretions in the airway or it could be due to the explosive opening of the collapsed airway. So there are both the hypotheses, both the theories. Secretions or collections inside the airways, the small and the medium airways, as well as the rapid or the explosive opening of a collapse segment, right? Now, coming on to the causes of crackles. There could be pulmonary edema. Second, CHF, that is congestive heart failure. Third, in cases of consolidation. And fourth, COPD. So these are the main causes where you can get a crackling sound. Now, coming on to the next one, which is a wheeze. This is how it is heard.
this wheezing sound is like a whistling sound so this is musical in nature and is continuous and is heard mainly in the expiratory phase but can be heard over in the inspiratory phase as well right now uh, this happens because of the passage of air through a narrowed lumen right which occurs because of the constriction of the airway so the causes are mainly the copd and the asthma right and this wheeze is a high pitch now coming on to the next one which is the wrong kai the next breath sound this is how it is heard as you have heard wrong kai and wheez are almost the similar the only difference is about the pitch the wrong kai are having a low pitch that's it everything is same the causes the pathology everything is same now coming on to the next one which is the strider this strider is musical sound and loud high pitched and this is produced mainly because of the obstruction in the upper airway tract right now if this strider occurs during inspiratory phase that suggests extra thoracic lesion example laryngomalacia or vocal cord lesions whereas if it occurs in the expiratory phase that suggests intra thoracic lesion example bronchomalacia or tracheomalacia or any external compression but if it occurs in both the phases that suggests there is a fixed obstruction like a stenosis tracheal stenosis so this is all about the strider now coming on to the next and the last one that is pleural rub this is how it is heard this pleural rub is non musical and is present in both the phases inspiratory and expiratory and this is leathery in character as you have heard and the reason for this pleural rub is mainly because of the inflamed pleura which are rubbing against each other right and these are usually associated with pleuritic chest pain or all right so thank you guys for watching that we're we're eventually we're going to talk about all of these so that wasn't a waste of time but just for this week we're, we're talking about rails and remember rails or crackles are due to uh, either just the fluid uh, as the air rushes by it or potentially and in, in, um, this I think this is more than just a hypothesis at this point but also the alve alveoli pop open uh, when exposed to the 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 negative pressure in the air that that rushes in and pops them open so it gives kind of a, a crackling cellophane like sound and we're going to continue uh with sounds so this is all a part of auscultation which we will cover in lab we, sorry excuse me sorry which we will cover in lab we we talked briefly about heart sounds s1 and s2 in uh our very first week uh, so we're just going to do a quick refresher on those, and then we're going to talk about some abnormal heart sounds, S3, uh, which might be normal in children, but is abnormal in adults, and then S4, which is always abnormal. S3 is actually a CHF hallmark, and likely it's due to a non-compliant left ventricle due to scarring from myocardial ischemia from a myocardial infarction. Uh, so it's kind of... It's kind of indicative of both a prior ischemic event and congestive heart failure. Uh, S4 is more of a vibratory sound uh, caused by a really faster than normal influx of blood into the ventricle, which is associated with hypertension. Uh, so it's not it's it's not necessarily a hallmark of CHF, but it does indicate that someone is certainly at risk for CHF. And then we'll talk about some heart murmurs as well. So this first video is normal heart sounds and murmurs, and then we'll look at S3 and S4.
When a healthy heart beats, it makes a lub-dub sound. The first heart sound, lub, also known as S1, is caused by the closing of the AV valves after the atria have pumped blood into the ventricles. The second heart sound, dub, or S2, originates from the closing of the aortic and pulmonary valves right after the ventricles have ejected the blood. The time interval between S1 and S2 is when the ventricles contract, called systole. The interval between S2 and the next S1 is when the ventricles relax and are filled with blood, called diastole. Diastole is longer than systole, hence the lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. Heart sounds are auscultated at four different sites on the chest wall, which correspond to the location of blood flow as it passes through the aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral valves, respectively. This is how similar defects associated with different valves are differentiated. Heart murmurs or whooshing sounds produced by turbulent flow of blood. Murmurs are diagnosed based on the time they occur in the cardiac cycle, their changes in intensity over time, and the auscultation site where they are best heard. Examples of conditions associated with common systolic murmurs include mitral valve regurgitation, when the mitral valve does not close properly and blood surges back to the left atrium during systole. The murmur starts at S1 when the AV valves close and maintains the same intensity for the entire duration of systole. This hollow systolic murmur is best heard at the mitral region, the apex, with radiation to the left axilla. On the other side of the heart, a tricuspid valve regurgitation has similar timing and shape, but is loudest in the tricuspid area, and the sound radiates up along the left sternal border. Aortic valve stenosis When the aortic valve does not open properly and blood is forced through a narrow opening, the blood flow starts small, rises to a maximum in mid-systole at the peak of ventricular contraction, then attenuates toward the end of systole. This results in a crescendo-decrescendo, or a diamond-shaped murmur, which starts a short moment after S1. It is often preceded by an ejection click caused by the opening of the stenotic valve. Aortic stenosis murmur is loudest in the aortic area and the sound radiates to the carotid arteries in the neck following the direction of blood flow. Again, on the other side of the heart, a pulmonic stenosis has the same characteristics but is best heard in the pulmonic area and does not radiate to the neck. Other conditions that cause audible systolic murmurs include ventricular septal defect and mitral valve prolapse. An example of diastolic murmurs is aortic valve regurgitation. This is when the aortic valve does not close properly, resulting in blood flowing back to the left ventricle during diastole, the filling phase. As the blood flows in the reverse direction, the murmur is best heard not in the aortic area but rather along the left sternal border. It peaks at the beginning of diastole when the pressure difference is highest, then rapidly decreases as the equilibrium is reached. Other common diastolic murmurs are associated with pulmonic regurgitation, mitral stenosis, and tricuspid stenosis. Thank you for watching. Okay, thank you guys. I know m much of that was not related to heart failure, but I did just want you to hear that normal S1, S2 in the beginning, and now we'll introduce S3 and S4.
So they made a really interesting point right there that I had not made. When heard together, think about congestive heart failure. So even though we talk about S3 being a hallmark of heart failure and S4 is associated with heart failure, but not necessarily a hallmark, when you see them together, that's especially indicative of heart failure. If you think about what S4 is, that rapid influx of blood due to hypertension, and other causes. Well, one of those other causes is that the ventricular, the ventricle, <laughs> the ventricle is not as compliant or flexible or extendable as it once was. And that is a hallmark of heart failure. Um, you know, that's a diastolic dysfunction. It's not able to fill as much, which means preload is decreased, which means uh, cardiac output is decreased, which is indicative of heart failure. So, uh, I know I know some of these are are tough. Um, you, this would take you know years of, uh, or at least months of practice and auscultating regularly. For boards, you just kind of need to know the basic written stuff. But if you ever do get in a cardiopulmonary clinic, uh, you'll you'll be doing this. So, um, but no one's going to expect you to be an expert at it right out of school. Oops. Okay, so another symptom, sorry, that was a lot of videos, I apologize. So another symptom of heart failure, especially right-sided heart failure, which leads to peripheral edema and venous distension, uh, is jugular vein distension. So this results from a fluid overload, essentially, in your venous system, um, because fluid is, the cardiac output of the right heart is not sufficient to, to decrease the backlog of fluid in the peripheral veins. So the best way to assess this is to have the patient lay at a 45 degree angle. And if you see more than four, four to five, but more than four centimeters of jugular vein distension above the sternal angle, that's indicative of, of venous distension and heart failure. It's a little bit subjective, to be honest. I mean, you definitely need to make sure you're looking at them at the appropriate angle and things, but um, you know, you'll see this when you make, uh, when, if you're working in the hospital or skilled nursing facility, you will see this. And typically this will be, this will be treated and addressed and reduced, but, but you'll still see it. Uh, another common symptom is pulsus alternance, which is a great name. It just means that the pulse strength alternates between high and low every other beat. So it's a mechanical alteration of the pulse with the regular rhythm. It just has an alternating strong and weak pulse. This is indicative of severely depressed myocardial dysfunction and heart and heart failure. Uh, you could check this by putting light pressure on the radial artery or femoral artery, uh, but uh, either way, you'll ask them to hold their breath in mid-expiration and feel for this. Breathing can affect it, so you just ask them to hold their breath. Another test is to uh, see if there's a 20 millimeter mercury decrease in systolic blood pressure during breath holding. So you would have them breathe normally, check their blood pressure, and then have them hold their breath and check their blood pressure. And if there's a big decrease, that's indicative of pulses alternans and heart failure. Uh, this is this is pretty common. Um, you might see cold, pale, cyanotic extremities like fingers and toes. Uh, this is due to increased sympathetic activation. So think about what's going on physiologically. You have a patient whose cardiac output is insufficient. One of the best ways to increase cardiac output in a normal individual is to stimulate the heart to beat more forcefully and more rapidly. That's accomplished by the sympathetic nervous system. Something else though that the sympathetic nervous system does is constrict blood vessels. So when you have widespread sympath sympathetic vasoconstriction, you have a tendency to get some changes in your extremities. Uh, decreased blood flow equals cold, pale, cyanotic extremities. Weight gain is incredibly common to the point where we are now required to check weight on every visit in home health uh, for someone with CHF. And it's encouraged to do so on people without CHF because it can be an early symptom. People with CHF retain water. Fluid volume increases. And we're actually, I think, going to talk about this on another slide, but let's just talk about why that is. So let's pretend this is a, a capillary. Oops. <laughs> it's not a very even capillary. And then outside here is tissue. You know, this is, these are cells and extracellular space, connective tissue, epithelial tissue. And let's say the pressure here is 40 
millimeters mercury or whatever it is, a hundred, uh, capillary pressure wouldn't be that high, but so, okay. So let's say it's 40 millimeters mercury and let's say the tissue pressure is 30 millimeters mercury. Fluid is going to leak out of the capillary. It's going to leak out of the capillary. And so it's not going to, um, I mean, it's going to cause peripheral edema. And then without getting too complicated, venous blood pressure may be so high that it doesn't have a tendency to return to venous circulation. So you're left with fluid accumulating in your tissues. Your body's fluid volume increases. That doesn't seem like it'd be such a bad thing, but remember, this is fluid volume outside of your circulatory system. So your, your blood volume uh, and fluid volume overall are two different things. So this can lead to pretty serious uh, weight fluctuations throughout throughout the day. You could have a several pound fluctuation in one day. And that's very indicative of CHF. Uh, that's why really you should be taking weight every visit, ideally at the same time, so you can track day-to-day -day fluctuations. Another common symptom of heart failure is sinus tachycardia. And remember, the response to decreased cardiac output is sympathetic stimulation, which equals rapid heart rate. So this is another sign of heart failure. Now, it has the word sinus in it, and we haven't talked about this yet. We're not, we haven't got into the ECG chapter yet, but when something's called a sinus rhythm, in this case, a sinus tachycardia, that means that the ECG itself is fairly normal. We have, the, we have all the right components, the P wave, the QRL, QRS complex, the T wave, no heart block necessarily. Um, the heart's being paced by the SA node. This is all stuff we'll talk about later. Uh, then, then that's, you know, that's called a normal sinus rhythm. This is abnormal because heart rate is so high, uh, and heart rate is so high in response to decreased blood pressure. And you have chemoreceptors telling your body that you need more blood, uh, you need more oxygen delivery and carbon dioxide release. This just further compounds the problem. Uh, and I just wanted to mention something really quick. So this is a, I believe this is a six second ECG strip. I'm not positive. Each one of these bigger red boxes is 0.2 seconds. So it looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. My eyes are getting blurry. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, almost 30. So 30 at 0.2 seconds. Um, yeah, that's six seconds. So you divide by five. Okay. So this is a six second ECG tracing. So what you can do is count the number of QRS complexes. These are these big spikes and multiply that by 10 to get beats per minute. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 times 10 is 120. 120 is over 100. So this is tachycardia. This is a sinus tachycardia rhythm uh, or, or ECG tracing. So, so this is very, this is very much associated with congestive heart failure. And remember, this would be at rest. Sinus tachycardia would be very normal in response to exercise. This is at rest in a CHF patient. Another common symptom is decreased exercise tolerance. It's sort of the combined effect of all the other symptoms we've just talked about. Someone with CHF is going to demonstrate early onset anaerobic metabolism. And so what that means is their body's ability to deliver oxygen is so impaired that they're going to go into anaerobic metabolism almost with any activity, depending on how severe their heart failure is. So that leads to decreased capacity because you can only exercise without oxygen for so long, you know, less than a minute. So this leads to muscle atrophy without oxygen. It withers away. Um, and sp specifically a loss of type one fibers, which are aerobic, uh, aerobic fibers that utilize oxygen and, uh, and, and aerobic respiration primarily. Uh, you can measure this decrease in aerobic capacity uh, using using oxygen measuring equipment, 
Um, however, you know, not everybody has that. So another great test that's highly correlated uh, with, with measuring oxygen directly is a six-minute walk test. And there's a table telling you what different distances are indicative of in your book, Table 410. This is a widely used test in the clinic and in research settings. It correlates well with a lot of other, uh, you know, more expensive tools for measuring exercise capacity. So, so you'll definitely be using that in clinical practice. You're simply just measuring how many um, feet or meters they can walk in six minutes. Okay, so some laboratory findings associated with CHF. A, a common one is, is protein proteinuria, which is going to reveal itself as an elevated specific gravity bun and creatinine level in urine. Uh, this is uh, you, you could do this in blood as well, I assume. Um, but these are all indicative of heart failure, and and you know uh, and and uh, my, myocardial. Uh, muscle dysfunction and and destruction of muscle fibers. You'll also have elevated liver enzymes like alkaline phosphatase. You know what's interesting? Uh, I, I've told you guys in previous chapters. A lot of my research has to do with predicting mortality using uh, algorithms, and all th well creatinine at least and alkaline phosphatase are two of the nine variables that most often, you know, when we're looking at a large data set come, come out, they end up being predictive of mortality, really predictive of mortality. And that's because of how many people die with CHF. Um, the most useful diagnostic test is an e is a, sorry, not an ECG, an echocardiogram. Um, and so this is going to look at ejection fraction, ventricular dimensions, the volume of the, of the chambers, wall thickness to look if there's hypertrophy or if you remember that one type of heart failure earlier where the muscle sort of atrophied away i can look at geometry and compliance of the heart muscle by looking at wall motion common medical treatments include sodium restriction this this uh, helps us deal with the hypertension and fluid retention associated with heart failure diuretics do as well uh, digitalis can slow uh, heart rate. And then you have ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and vasodilators, all working on lowering blood pressure and slowing heart rate. Now, it's counterintuitive because a lot of these things address the symptoms brought about by your body trying to increase cardiac output. But your body's cure makes it worse over time. So what you have to force somebody to do or what you have to force someone's body to do is the opposite of what the body wants to do. The body wants to increase cardiac output. So that means increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, uh, increased contractivity. We need to slow all that down um, so that the body can, can recover, so the heart can recover. The problem is this person is going to be exhausted uh, because not only is their cardiac output diminished, but you've taken away the body's ability to respond to increase demand. Uh, so that's going to be a real a hallmark sign of heart failure is just rapid exhaustion. Um, this is another special measure. This is a left ventricular assist device that is actually a mechanical pump that can force blood out of the left ventricle. I've seen people with these. This is pretty amazing technology. And then, of course, proper prescription of physical activity. Um, now, that, that means a few different things, so we'll wait till we get to that slide. Okay, there is a lengthy assessment that I would love for you guys to read on page 111 in the fourth edition of your book. Um, so please just go ahead and read through that. And based on those findings, you develop a plan of care consisting of these three things, exercise training, ventilatory exercises, and energy conservation. It seems a little intuitive because we're conserving energy and exercising. The point is we want the patient to conserve energy as much as possible and have a very structured progressive exercise program that's supervised. Uh, so I know that seems a little counterintuitive, but both are very important. So uh, guidelines for exercise training, this will be on boards. 
So I think the book lays it out as good as any anything. So please just read the uh, two different things. So a summary of interventions for CHF, table 414, but especially pay attention to the exercise training guidelines on page 114. I will be asking some quiz questions about this. This has to do with when you should terminate an exercise program, how you should progress an exercise program, et cetera. So exercise guidelines are, are big on the MPTE. So please read that. Another uh, practice that PTs can do, you know, this is something that respiratory therapists do as well, but uh, we can train ven ventilatory muscles. And so part of that is instructing in diaphragmatic breathing. Breathe in through your nose. Make sure your belly is expanding. You know, don't raise your shoulders. Don't use accessory muscles. Belly breathe. Um, you can also instruct someone in pursed lip breathing. That increased uh, positive end expiratory pressure or PEEP causes the alveoli to inflate and become functional again. So it's very useful. And then you can use an incentive spirometer, like the, the tool pictured here, to work on um, their ability to increase their inspiration uh, and expiration volumes. Uh, so this is, this is a useful tool for that as well. Energy conservation is a big part of CHF. It seems a little silly because we want... We want our patients to expend energy, but it needs to happen in a certain way. We don't just want them constantly exhausted with their heart overloaded 24 hours a day. We want them to conserve as much energy as possible until we can put them in a structured exercise plan and push them in a progressive manner under supervision. And then we want them to spend the rest of the day relaxed. We're trying to, we don't want their heart fighting for cardiac output all the time. That's how we got in this mess. That's how we got hypertrophy. That's how we got reduced compliance. That's how we got hypertension and peripheral edema and cyanosis, etc. So energy conservation is huge. It prevents dyspnea and fatigue. So some of this stuff may seem a little silly, but surprisingly, no one says this to a patient. You need to instruct them to sit while working, stop and rest if they start to feel exhausted, People have a tendency to push themselves a little bit too far, and that can be damaging. Spread difficult tasks out throughout the week. Uh, you don't necessarily need to move the entire guest bedroom uh, to a different room because you have company coming in a month the day before. Spread that out over the week. Get people to help you. Uh, if you do have a difficult task like that, do it for a little bit and then switch to something else. Alternate to something easy. Um, and then always try to keep items within reach. Now, obviously, someone with severe heart failure won't be moving a bedroom, but you, you get the idea. Uh, a difficult task uh, could, could be different things to different people. The point is you just want them to spread that out. And that's it for, for our, uh, our, our heart failure chapter. Um, there's a really good summary in your book on page 117. I'll pull some quiz questions out of there as well as some of the other questions I mentioned. And if you have any questions, just ask me in lab. Thanks for listening.